Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have our good friend Chad Carson back. And Chad is one of my absolute go tos in terms of real estate investing. He's just absolutely brilliant and he has the right ethos. And I think that comes through loud and clear in his brand new book that's actually coming out this week called The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor How to Reach Financial Freedom with Fewer Rental Properties. And I really emphasize that word fewer because I think. It's so important, especially in the real estate world where you hear more, more, more. How many quote unquote doors do you have? How much leverage can you pile on? How can you make this bigger? But what about enough? And I think that word enough is just so critical. And Chad's book is a wonderful focus on what is truly enough to achieve your financial and life goals. With that, welcome to Choose FI. Chad, it is so good to see you. Welcome back to Choose a Five, my friend. It is good to be back, Brad. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, this should be great. So we have a lot to talk about because clearly you have this book that's coming out this Thursday, July 20th, 2023. And the book's fantastic. You gave me an early copy of it. I was fortunate enough to be able to give it a, a little blurb. And I really think it's important. And I told you that personally. I just, I think this is important because I just find that the real estate community, and of course, this is a broad brush and I hate to do that, but they seem focused on the wrong things to me. And this book kind of corroborates that thought in my own head. And I'd love for you to talk about how you see that, like how this idea coalesced in your mind in opposition to what this drumbeat is from the real estate community. Well, thank you for your feedback and your support. This has been a, a book, this, the seedling was been many years ago, and it really started for me as a new real estate investor because, like you said, I've experienced a lot of good education, a lot of helpful education, but my very first three or four years in real estate investing, I went to seminars and I was sitting in a hotel room and there was a lot of rah-rah, you know, like, hey, let's go big, you know, and there's a kind of a mix of psychology and, you know, you should have your head on straight and really shoot for the moon. And if you're not you know, buying 100 properties, you're not shooting big enough. You should 10x and you should do all these big things. And, you know, there's a part of us, like, especially if you're ambitious, you know, everybody listening to this has some kind of ambition in them. And, you know, when somebody challenges you like that, you're like, well, that must be success. That must be the way it is. And I sort of bought into that early on in my career, but through a series of just some mistakes that I made where I was buying too many properties going into 2007 and eight and the Great Recession, that was a fun experience. (laughs) <laughs> and a combination of that and also just, you know, getting introduced to the FIRE community, to reading you know, Your Money or Your Life. That was a huge game changer for me where this concept of enough was put on my plate. And it's one of those ideas where when you first read it, you're like, wait a minute, this is something I've known all along. And yet I haven't incorporated it into my investing style, into my business. And so reading that, reading The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss back at the same time, there's just a couple of those moments, both in my real estate business and reading books that said, wait a minute, you know, what about trying to do it simpler? What about trying to do it smaller? And we had to sort of implement that in the middle of the recession. Thankfully, we were able to survive some of our early mistakes in our first five years of real estate investing by having a lot of cash reserves, by hustling, by just making it through the Great Recession. But on the other side of that, my business partner and I have a 50-50 business partner. Our strategy was, we didn't call it the small and mighty investor at that time, but it was about how can we simplify this thing? How can we systematize it? And most importantly, how can we work it backwards from why are we doing this thing in the first place? Like, why are we even investing in real estate? Why are we doing this? We were doing this to have life, to have to travel. In my case, I, wanted, I wasn't married yet, but I knew that I wanted to travel. I wanted to have flexibility. I wanted to do other things with my life, not just real estate investing. And so that was my challenge as a real estate investor, as a business owner to say, how could I do this so that I still have the income and the wealth benefits, all those things that real estate's great for, but to do it in a smaller amount of time to simplify it. And that's really what, you know, last 15 to 20 years of my real estate investing business has been all about. Wow. Yeah. I I love that. And I think we're going to put a pin in that right there because I want to talk about that working backwards. That's the place we'll pick it up. But since you set this up on a silver platter in terms of, hey, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want to do? What is this all for? Right? Like these are the essential questions that we should all be asking, especially, right, as you're saying, people are not doing this in the real estate investing community. You and your family have been off on adventures now for the better part of 
how many number of years? It's, it's been a lot. And I know you're actually finishing up an amazing 12 month stay in Spain right now. And I'd love for us to just take a couple of minutes to talk about that, because I think that is so important that why, why are we doing this? And you've had these remarkable things going on in your life. Yeah. So going back to that 2007, eight episode where I was sort of up against the wall, think, what, why am I doing this? I, I made a list at that time that said, here are the things I want to do. And one of the, the highlights was I want to travel abroad. Um, I went to, when I was at university, I played football and I've studied abroad a little bit, but I just got this itch to travel and explore other cultures, to learn new languages. So I just knew that was a kind of a center part of my, what I wanted my life to be about. And wouldn't you know it, I met somebody who I ended up marrying, who on our first date, we talked about the same thing. We're like, she's like, I really would love to go live abroad and do this and travel around. And I said, huh, that's interesting. That works out. Okay. Let's do this. All right. Um, (laughs) So as we started working on the, the financial independence adventure, we tried to say, how could we do this? And so we've taken a series of trips before we had kids. We went abroad for four months and traveled around to Spain and South America When we had three and five-year-old kids, actually, the first time I came on the Choose FI podcast was I was in Ecuador with my wife and kids, and we lived there for 17 months, and my kids learned to speak Spanish there. I took Spanish. It was just, there was no purpose in being there other than let's slow things down. Let's press pause. Let's test this experiment of whether we can actually have rental properties back in the United States and only work two to four hours per week and live a life somewhere else. And so that was, you know, experiment number two. And then experiment number three was us going this last year, went to Granada, Spain. And so we've been living here. We rented a house. Our kids went to local schools here. My wife has been teaching English and taking classes. I was telling you one of my favorite things to do just as a hobby is just to walk the streets. Like I love walkable communities. And I, my home base, our home base in the United States is Clemson, South Carolina, which is relatively walkable town. It's a university town, but it's got a long way to go. And I've been trying to get it to improve it. But being in a town like Granada, which is thousands of years old, where you have these little narrow streets and you can wander around like in a maze for hours and hours and just walk and walk and walk and study history. That's been between that and studying Spanish and writing a book. That's pretty much what I've done for the last 12 months. (laughs) Yeah, that is incredible. And uh, so as a sidebar, I love how humble you are because, oh, I played a little bit of college football. (laughs) Meanwhile, (laughs) you played for Clemson University. (laughs) I think, were you team captain also? Am I remembering right? Yeah, I was, I was, I was the team captain my last two years. So junior and senior year. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I I played a little bit of college football. That's great. So yeah, in terms of, of walkability, it's funny that, that you've hit on that. Obviously you've hit on that much more than I have, but anecdotally in my own life, that is the thing that I've realized that I crave when I travel, especially. And I think about that in terms of where do I want to live in the future? Because when we went and visited a uh, family in a little part of London called Chiswick, it was just like the perfect location. And it just made me realize, wow, this is a gaping hole in my life that I didn't realize I had. We were literally like 70 yards from the high street and like the m and grocery store and a hundred yards from the underground station on the other side. And it was like just inside zone two in the underground. So it was like super close. All the restaurants, everything was walkable. It was, it was amazing. There were parks. It was like, what am I doing in this little island of suburbia? I don't understand. Yeah, it's what well, I think the superpowers of FI is, as we progress is that you can change locations, whether it's for two weeks or whether it's for 12 months like we're doing. And you can experiment with where you like to live and like not only where you like to live, even if you're rooted in a community, which we have pretty deep roots in the in South Carolina and Clemson, I have family nearby. We've decided to, you know, there's things we don't like along with things we like. We, we've decided to try to help change some of the things we don't like. But it's so cool to travel and visit other places. And, and it's, it's almost like you're trying on new clothes and you're like, oh, wow. Like for us in Granada, like two minute walk to the grocery store, five minute walk to five little plazas, you know, five minute walk to our kids' school. I walk my kids to and from school every day. I played pickup soccer and pickup basketball with a group of friends who I would bump into and say hello to in the street every day. There's just this fabric of a community that happens when you're in a walkable community. And one of my frustrations in the United States and North America, really Canada as well, is just how little 
we see each other on a physical basis. Yeah, we see each other through the windshield. And a lot of it is like people are frustrated like you and I are, but a lot of it is why is it that way? And we could go down this rabbit hole forever, but a lot of it's the infrastructure and the way things were built in 1940s and 50s, the way the car culture kind of took over and it's just become lopsided a little bit. And so it's really interesting to, to study it and to think about it. And, and so for those of you wanting to have some fire uh, financial independence aspiration, this is a rabbit hole you could go down for sure when you start looking into the how to build communities and how to structure them from a kind of physical standpoint of roads and zoning and all of that. Yeah, I love how you've jumped into that so thoroughly with all that important stuff. I, I just think very clearly I'm at the surface level of this in terms of even, okay, I might not have to move to London or Granada, Spain. What about in my own community in terms of the gym that I go to? It's one of these kind of like Equinox style gyms that has a little bit of everything. There's a pool, there's a sauna, there's a, all this stuff, an incredible gym. And I'm like, wow, this is in one of those mixed use communities. If I lived a 30 second walk from that gym, which is very possible, there are like 100 apartments and 50 townhouses within a, a minute or two walk, I would probably just graze in and out of there a couple of times a day. And again, this is silly, I'm not doing it. But like that thought chat has crossed my mind. And it's like, okay, why are we spending so much time talking about this? Because it's important. It actually is like, yeah, I'm not going to move to this community, but that I'm thinking about this in terms of what do I want a future portion of my life to look like? I think people can start implementing that with maybe their next move or start thinking about it. Like you're saying, on a more systematic basis, you can start potentially changing zoning and et cetera. Like that's a heavier lift, but like that doesn't mean it's impossible by any means. And it, it's really, really important. Yeah, you can do it really small. I've been really interested in, you know, give them a plug, but a, a community called uh, Strong Towns. And okay. it's a, they've got a podcast, they've got a, a blog, but it's a really enthusiastic community of people like us who just try to do little tiny things. Like, for example, my wife and I would walk with our kids to our American school, our elementary school every morning. And there's this one crossing that was dangerous. Like two kids almost got hit by cars going too fast. And we kept complaining, but we got into the fact that the, the road was a state road instead of a city road. And the city kept on putting their hands up saying, we can't do anything. It's a state road. And the state wouldn't listen to us. But you know what? You can like use your social media and you can use your local media and you, you could get involved. And we got it. Wouldn't you know it? My wife kind of spearheaded it, but we got a, a crosswalk with a stop sign. And that's a big win. Like you can do these little things that don't cost you a lot of money, a lot of time. But I keep on going back to like, you know, if I superpowers, it's like, that's when you have time to do that. My wife and I have spent 10 to 20 hours a week for the last eight years in our community, trying to make it more walkable building. We've started a nonprofit called the Friends of the Green Crescent Trail, trying to build a network of walking and biking trails in our seven square mile community. That's all, you know, my details, but the point is like, these are really cool things that you don't necessarily make any money from them. But the whole point for me of like a small and mighty investor is someone who has like this enormous amount of time to do whatever matters to them. And for us, spending time with kids, traveling, getting involved in trying to make my community better. Those are things that needed to be done, but everybody's so busy with work and they don't have their money taken care of, but they don't have enough time to volunteer and to do that. And so we're like, we're like the spark plugs. We're like, Hey, let's go get this done. Let's, yeah. Somebody's got to make it happen. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding and it gives you purpose. And it's, it's something that's going back to the community. It's like, it's, it's grassroots. Like it's where you live. And when you see that one crosswalk it sounds so simple, when you see that crosswalk go in, you take pride in your community and you feel more hopeful that the next thing could happen and the next thing. And it's just kind of feeds itself. Right. It makes you realize you can affect change on the world. Yeah. And that is just such an alluring thing. Like that makes you feel, I mean, you talk about small and mighty. It makes you feel powerful that you have an ability to make the world better. And I think that is, it's kind of part of the, the psychological framework, I think, of the Phi community in terms of, we think about it on, in our own micro lives. Like we can take action to make our lives better. And I think that is what has caused this community to blow up worldwide in terms of, hey, you have to get up off the couch and you have to take action to make your life better. And we see it in terms of, again, micro is obvious, like people are making their lives better all across the world. But then I even see like the next step up is I've had dozens of emails. I got one just the other day of, hey, my company didn't have a 401k plan or, hey, my company had this 401k plan. And the fees were egregious. They were like one and a half percent in terms of expense ratios on every single fund. And I, not, not I, Brad, but I, the person who wrote this in said, I spent a year going over with my bosses and HR that, that why we need to change this. And it, it actually happened. 
Chad, I mean, those are the kind of wins you're talking about a stop sign. Like that doesn't sound silly. That sounds like something that is affecting change on the world. And I think it's, I think it's brilliant. So love that sidebar. Let's transition back to real estate. And again, we have so much to talk about, but let's use this walkability as the transition, because I think you've told me in the past that part of your investing strategy, actually in Clemson, where you have most of, maybe all of your real estate investments has actually been built around location down to potential walkability. And I had no idea. I'd never heard you say that before, just this you know, one instance, but talk me through like, where did that thought process come from? Because I think this, this is that perfect segue back into, all right, what is enough? Yeah. The, one of the cool things that I love about real estate investing, and there's, there's pluses and minuses to everything. We all know this, right? Like I, I love index fund investing as well. And there's pluses and minuses of that. One of the biggest pluses of real estate is that you can affect change going back to that theme. Like you can actually be an entrepreneur and make decisions about where you invest, the type of property you buy, the type of financing you get, you can negotiate with sellers. So I, I always found that real estate is a really good vehicle for people who want to be either a little bit or a lot involved in their portfolio on the front end so that they can then have a really good portfolio on the back end that produces income and generates wealth. And one of the little just things I stumbled upon as I started going down this rabbit hole of walkability was that actually my wife and I moved into our first, very first house hack. Like we, we lived in a fourplex and it was actually my second home. I lived in a single family home for like seven months and I realized I couldn't afford it. And so I rented that one out and said, all right, let me get back to a house hack. And nice. I moved into unit number two. And when my wife and I got married, she moved in with me. We lived in this place and it was sort of walkable. Like it, we, we could walk to the downtown area. Almost every evening we'd walk there, we'd go eat sushi in our little downtown. We'd Across the road, but it just like living there, it was a wonderful memory for me still. And we still own that building. We still rent it out, knowing that that was like something we did on a day to day basis, living in this rental property that we had. And so as we bought more properties, I started thinking about it from the perspective of our tenant. You know, how could we make this an amazing place for our tenants to live? I happen to be in a college town. And so most of our rentals are in Clemson. And when you think about a student who goes to university, one of the biggest daily rituals is going from their house to campus where they have classes and getting there as quickly, as easily as they can. And then on the weekends, going to friends' houses, going to downtown, going to parties, whatever they're going to do. And so the convenience factor of either being able to walk, which is, I've, I've heard that typically like if you can go a 15 minute walk, half a mile is kind of like a good judge for how long somebody will walk voluntarily who's not like a professional you know, athlete. <laughs> or you could do a mile and a half or three or four or five for, for biking. But biking is another animal because you also have to have a safe place to bike, even if it's convenient, if there's not a separated lane, if it's not safe, you know, only the really brave bikers do that. And this place we lived in happened to be on a bus line as well. And so you could be on the bus line, you could take the bus to downtown, or you could walk. It was about a mile and a quarter. So it's a little bit outside the walkability range, but we found that it was a, a great part of our experience. And so we started buying more properties in that same little neighborhood. It just happened to be there's older properties there. And it just, it, that was a very micro criteria. It's a very specific criteria, but I learned that in real estate, there's like two qualities you want to look for. Number one, there's this just location and building factor, which is, it has to do with the tenant. It has to do with what it's like to live there. It has to do with the quality of life. And you can choose properties that have that and you can exclude properties that don't have that. And then the other thing that matters in real estate are the numbers, just cold, hard, my financing, the cash flow, the analysis. And I, you know, when I was a new investor, I leaned heavily on the analysis and the cash flow. And I bought some properties in bad locations that were not that great over the long run to rent. And they were really management intensive. And over time, I sold those properties and learned to only own the properties in the best locations with walkability as one of our factors. And also the numbers have to make sense as well. But if you focus on the location first, especially as a small and mighty investor, because we can get down on the micro street by street level we can go walk the streets. We can talk to neighbors. We can do things that a lot of big, huge hedge funds and big, massive investors won't do. That's one of our competitive advantages of being small. And so I, I found that to be the case for us. And it's been a big part of what I've implemented and also taught other people to do is to really focus in on the just make yourself a list of criteria on what makes a good location and investment property for you. Yeah, Chad, I love that. It, it seems like it's funny. We've, we've hit on this working backwards, which we are going to come back to in terms of, of the money. But I'm using that now as the operating theory of our whole conversation here, and it just keeps spinning, right? So what's the end goal here? It's, okay, obviously we need to get enough income, but it's also to not let this overtake your life and to maybe be able to do it like you're doing two to four hours a week or thereabouts. Okay, what does that mean? Like you just said, you sold these nightmarish properties that maybe nightmare is an exaggeration, but you sold these properties that have 
a lot of extra work needed because maybe the numbers made sense in theory, or at least on paper at first. But when the rubber hit the road, man, that's a headache. And I don't want a headache if it's not giving me, even maybe if it is giving me an outsized return, but especially if it's not, right? Yes. And a lot of people judge real estate, whether they get into it or not, by those worst scenarios. And my mm. experience has been the best properties. It's not just like a two or three times less hassle factor. It's like a hundred times less less hassle. It's, it's a huge difference. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those 80, 20, or maybe a 5%, 95% rules where if, if you get the 5% of the least hassle properties, and this typically is like single family houses, are the best, the least hassle. I have a mentor named John Schaub who wrote a book, Building Wealth One House at a Time. And he just, after 50 years investing in real estate, he just buys houses. He's owned apartments. He's owned all the other stuff. I haven't learned his lessons yet. I, I do own <laughs> small apartment buildings. They've been pretty good for me in a college town. But the type of property you buy, if you have a tenant living in a single family house who mows their own lawn, who takes care of the house, who stays there for 10, 15, 20 years, you can't imagine how much less hassle that is than an apartment or even an Airbnb, which I also like, but like those are just different ends of the spectrum in terms of how much involvement you have to get. And so part of my strategy as a as I grew as an investor, I start off as you know new investor, just get a deal or two, build wealth for a while. That was kind of phase number two, just try to grow, grow, grow. But phase number three, as I started thinking about like transitioning and harvesting my wealth, I had to start thinking about the types of properties, the locations, the debt structure, which I know we'll probably talk about as well. But those kind of decisions that really matter a lot if you want to have lifestyle and be able to travel and literally work a couple hours a week. That's I've tracked it for the last about four or five years now. That's That's been my, my schedule in terms of working on real estate. Wow. Just a couple of hours a week. Yeah. That is amazing. But right when you're optimizing for, okay, what's the least hassle? Not what's the way that I can eke out the most amount of money, regardless of the, as Nick Majuli said, the return on hassle. When you don't look at it like that, but you look at it in terms of, okay, small and mighty investor. How can I get 80-20 analysis? Like you said, how can I find those properties that are going to give me the least amount of headache that obviously are still giving me a return? I mean, let's be clear here. We're not saying we're, we're not trying to get returns furthest thing from it. But if all things are equal and you have two properties, one is a nightmare, one is not, and you're looking to cull one of those, it's pretty clear which one is going to be sold in that case. Exactly. And so I would say, number one, pick the right properties. And then number two, going back to the whole point of this fork in the road in the real estate space, one is like scale, scale, scale. And their, their solution to this problem would be you need to build systems, you need to hire people, and you need to step above your business and just run the business. That's like the typical business advice you get is you need to build this big operation and then you can be the CEO and eventually the shareholder of the company. Like that's possible. Like people do it every day. But I think the, the thing that's not talked about with that kind of traditional business ladder is that it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to build systems. It's really hard to build operations. And so my, my advice is to pick the right properties and call your properties down to a small, manageable size portfolio. And yes, build systems. Yes, like I outsource a lot. The reason I can work two hours per week as opposed to like 60 to 80 hours a week like I did when I first started was I outsourced a lot to property managers. I let my tenants and my houses do you know, the, the lawn maintenance and they, you know, they can call the plumber here and there. So like there's ways to build systems, but you can't systematize everything. There's always going to be fires to put out and it's hard to do. And so having a small portfolio, I think, is a secret sauce to eventually having the, the lifestyle, the time freedom, the flexibility that you want. Chad, we're going to come right back to this because I want to ask you actually what makes up those two to four hours per week. Because yeah, in theory, you've had now 15 plus years of iterating and trying to figure this out. And like you said, there are always fires. I, I want to talk about that. But I did want to just very quickly go back to something absolutely brilliant you said a handful of minutes ago. It would be a crime to not focus on this. And this is with that operating theory of working backwards. And, and it's subtle here. In terms of, you said about Clemson, okay? I'm in a college town. What do people want to do there? What are they doing? They're going to school. And again, this sounds subtle, but this is really important. I have another example that I just thought of. Okay, what that means is, like you said, people are gonna wanna walk to their classes. So you said also it could come down to one or two streets. Now picture that like in a real world scenario, there's some main thoroughfare there, right? Like a six lane or four lane, let's say major road, which, oh, it sounds great. Hey, I'm close to this access and there are shops and restaurants. But if you're on the other side of that from campus, well, that's going to be a whole lot more difficult to walk to campus than if you were on 
the other side of that main road. So you might see two properties that are within 200 yards of each other, but one is dramatically easier for, again, when you're working backwards of what are they actually doing there? They're going to school. Now, another example that I thought of was, Chad, like Airbnb. What are people doing there? They're sleeping in most cases, right? So I think about all the Airbnbs that I've gone to, they're shades. Like, I know this sounds silly, but I'm a sleep optimizer. Like the curtains or shades that they have are horrendous. You get woken up at 515 with streams of light coming in. I was just at one of these places last, last week. A simple little investment of a couple hundred dollars to get blackout shades or you know blackout curtains would be a massive difference and would just show to me that that Airbnb host is really thinking about what am I doing? What are these people doing here? And how can I work backwards? So like that's actually a pretty cool way to go through life is to think about that. Yeah. And the cool thing about real estate, and some people might be thinking about this if they haven't done real estate, like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. I got to figure all these things out about the shades and all that. But the cool thing about real estate is it's pretty intuitive. Like we've all lived in an apartment. We've all lived in a house. We've probably at this point all gone to an Airbnb. And so if you work it backwards from the experience of your customer, your tenant who lives there and say, what kinds of things does that person want to do? All right. They want to sleep without being woken up at 5 a.m. They want to walk to the campus. They want to walk to downtown. And this applies everywhere. This isn't just a college town thing. Like it, everywhere I visit, I'm in here at Granada. There's an old community, like the oldest community in Granada is the best. Like it's the place where people want to live. And if you look at the rents, if you can go on Zillow and anybody can do this, go look in your town at where the rents are highest and where the prices are the highest. That's your A location. Like that's where people want to live. And as a real estate investor, you start asking yourself the question, like, why? Like, why do people like living there? Sometimes it's because there's a park there. Sometimes there, some people follow Starbucks, for example, in certain towns. Oh, there's a Starbucks there. I'm going to go within a quarter mile of that. And so th these are pretty intuitive things that you don't have to have a, you know, a rocket science you know, degree in how to analyze markets. No, you just need to be a shopper who's lived in properties and go get on the street, walk in the neighborhood, you know, walk to that eight lane road and say, wait a minute, like, this road is like getting in the way of me getting to the place I want to go. I bet a property on the other side of this would be much more valuable than this side. That's intuitive, but that matters when you get into real estate. Yeah. And I think it's funny because I, I just thought of another example. And as you said, like, think about your own life and what are those little kind of pain points? And if you have that problem, other people undoubtedly do as well. And I think about like, hotels. Chad, this is the one that bothers me the most. So yeah, I'm getting my little uh, pet peeves out here. And this is Go fun. For it. <laughs> you think about a hotel chain like Marriott or Hyatt. I mean, they have dozens of brands, but when you walk into a hotel room, it's the same darn thing. It's two queen beds. You think about, there's not one person. There's not one person. I don't care. Maybe you went to the Cornell school of hotel management or something like there's not one smart person that has ever said like, Oh, wow. Maybe People in families go to sleep at different times. Oh, wow, maybe families come larger than four people, right? Like having flexibility in terms of the number of beds would be brilliant. If you had five single beds, you have a, a bunk bed in the corner for kids, you have a, a little curtain that goes around it. Think about how families could actually enjoy that room so much more. The parents could be out, the kids could be behind a curtain in their bunk beds. Like, goodness, there's not one person who's smart enough at one of these major brands to figure this out and like make life easier for families. And again, that's working backwards from a lived experience of, oh, wow, I have a kid who goes to sleep at nine. I have a kid who goes to sleep at 11. And the kid who goes to sleep at 11 has to hang out in the bathroom of the hotel room, right? Like, so anyway, I'm harping on this because I think, Chad, I, I hope this is actually a takeaway is, is this working backwards because it's a cool way to think about problems and think about more importantly, solutions. And I think that's what you've done with such, such wonder here with the small and mighty is, okay, let's get back to like the working backwards from the money. Because most real estate investors say, hey, what's the most that I can get? How much can I scale this up to? Can I get a thousand doors? And I think you take the exact opposite tact. And I'd love to hear you talk through that. Yeah. I, and part of this is, is thinking about working it backwards from the person, you, who's listening to this, who's actually going to be investing. Think about your journey as a real estate investor. So you're going, to, you're going to start as a new investor. Your goal is just going to get a deal, get one or two deals, learn. You're going to learn a ton. That's, that's your goal at that point. The second stage, though, you go to this, this wealth builder stage is what I call it. And it's where you're really accelerating and your focus during that stage is taking a $100,000 nest egg and turning it into a million dollar nest egg. Or you're trying to reach your five number. You're trying to get to this point where you can actually live off of your investments. And so that a lot of what you hear, the advice you hear in the real estate space are tools and strategies focused on that. And that's great. That's where a lot of people are. And that's fine. What I find missing, though, and what I, one of the gaps I'm trying to fill with this book 
is like at some point you've got to change the game you're playing. Like you got to switch your tools because eventually like continuing to move the goalpost and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and saying, all right, I'm making $300 per month in cash flow. I want to make $120,000 per year. I, oh, that's a lot of properties, 300 times, whatever I got to get, right? Well, here's the transition point. And this is where it's a little counterintuitive is at some point when you have enough equity or maybe more than enough equity that you, on, on paper, you could actually live off of this. And what you can do and what I did was my business partner and I started changing how we allocated our cash flow. So instead of going and buying another property and saying, all right, we got $100,000 saved up or $20,000 saved up, we're not going to go put that as a down payment on another property. We're actually going to go pay off properties. We're going to pay off the debt on our properties because the key word, you know, going back to your money or your life, we had enough. Like we had enough properties where, and I can, I'm happy to go through some of the base, real simple math, but we had enough that we knew we could cover our financial independence number with theoretically, if we just turn that equity into more cash flow with our rental properties. And so paying off debt is one of these like sacrilegious things to do in the real estate community for some reason. But it's something that number one, reduces your risk, which is we should talk about, you know, risk is the chance that things go wrong. Like what if we have a very small chance, but what if we have another, you know, depression for 10 years and rents go down by 30, 40% and values go down by 60 or 70%. What if that happens? Like it's possible, right? And if you've already built a million dollars in net worth or $2 million, why take a chance of going backwards back to where you started 10, 15 years later? Like it, it doesn't, Warren Buffett had a quote saying like, it makes zero sense. It's like insanity to risk what you already have to get something you don't need. <laughs> like it's, it's insanity. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so the practical application that I'm trying to put forward as real estate investors is yeah, use debt as a tool. It's great. You know, just, just use that as leverage. But at some point, let's start talking about strategies to reduce your risk, pay it off. It also increases your income. Like if you have a thousand dollar mortgage payment on a hundred thousand dollar loan that you've had for ten years, like pay that off, and you're you've now freed up a thousand dollars per month or twelve thousand dollars per year investing a hundred thousand dollars. That's a twelve percent quote cash on cash return. Like you're freeing up twelve thousand dollars a year. So there's that's, that's a good thing. Like that's helping you. That's part of the, the math of living off your rental properties is freeing up cash flow, is reducing your risk, but it also has a psychological benefit is that it, one of the tough things about real estate is that stock investing has like dollar cost averaging. Just every month, invest, 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 invest. And over time, the market goes up. Real estate's a little more, you know, like you, you kind of goes in lurches. You buy a property, you do this. But if you start saving up money and doing something like a debt snowball, it gives you a very specific place to put your money instead of like spending that money on a vacation or spending it on, on something stupid. It's like, no, like I'm going to save up until I get a hundred thousand bucks and I'm going to pay this loan off. Like that's, it's a psychological benefit that it gives you a goal. And then the fourth reason I like paying off debt is that there's just simplicity. So you, you've made, there's a fork in the road here. You've made a choice to have a smaller portfolio and kind of draw a line in the sand and say, at this point, this transition in my career, I'm going to simplify, increase income, reduce risk instead of trying to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you could always grow later on, by the way. You could always refinance your property. And my business partner and I have had a lot of these like multiple forks in the road, like, ah, let's, let's grow a little bit more. Let's do this. But once you take your chips off the table, to use a poker metaphor, you've now made a decision to become more small and mighty, to reduce your risk. And it's a different, it's a different path. And the, the thing I will say about it, a lot of people have paid off their home and made this decision and had these debates about whether you should pay it off or not. The peace of mind I had during COVID, during a really difficult time when I was nervous, I'm like, I don't know if the college student is going to come back to school right. for the next year. I had no clue for a, a month or two there. But the peace of mind I had having a really safe portfolio wasn't 100 percent debt free, but was, you know we had like 10 or 15 percent of our whole value of our portfolio was debt. Meaning like if you had a million dollar portfolio, we had like $150,000. Right. Which is debt. astonishing. Let's be clear. It sounds like a big number when you say it out loud like yeah. that, but that is astonishingly low percentage. Yeah. And we started off at 70%, right? So it's over the years, we've just plugged away, plugged away, plugged away. We've kept some debt here and there that was you know really low long-term interest debt. But my, my whole kind of long point here is that to work it backwards from what you want, which is in my case, travel work a couple hours per week in my business, have enough income to pay for all my expenses for our family. That was a key component of working it backwards was putting the tool of debt back in the toolbox saying, you know, it was a good tool. Glad I used you when I did, but transitioning to a point where I have a lower debt, lower risk portfolio. And it was the best decision we've ever made. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. I love how you keep saying debt as a tool, right? Because it's funny, I highlighted in a quote in the book, 
debt is a tool, not a religion. And I think I've identified a couple of these quasi-religious communities, let's say, in, in the financial world. Obviously, you see with Bitcoin and the, the laser eyes, you see it with the dividend investors, for sure, and these leverage-loving real estate investors. I mean, those are the three that jump out to me immediately, that it, it just it seems like all reason and rationality get thrown out. And it's just like, okay, we've determined this is the best way to do it. So therefore you're an idiot if you, if you don't follow. And I just, I find that like abhorrent in every way. And I, I wanted to ask about the nuts and bolts of this transition, because like you said, you went from roughly 70% debt to about 10 or 15 now. And let's talk through like really how somebody would do this, because I think this ties to like the fundamental essence of what you're talking about with small and mighty. So all right, if someone's investing and they bought their first two properties, everything's going well, and okay, it's time to buy a third or a fourth, like at what point would they figure out, all right, that's enough in terms of the number of properties, and it might be smart to transition to starting to pay them off? Like, how do you think about that? Because that's there's a sliding scale there. Yeah. So it's a really good question. There, there's a little bit of wiggle room here. So I'm going to give you some rules of thumb. But you know, one thing I, advice I give in the book, and I actually have a whole exercise where you can figure out what your small and mighty investor number is. That's a really important. It's important, not because it's going to be exactly what yours is going to be five or 10 years from now, but just to have a goal to shoot for. And one, one way to figure that out is you can think about a property. I'm going to give you real simple numbers just to make it easy for people listening. Let's say you had a house that rented for $1,800 per month, $1,800 per month. And after all of your operating expenses, so that means your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, a management fee, everything, except for your mortgage payment, let's say you had left over $1,000 per month. Those numbers are pretty real. I have a lot of properties having $800 in operating expenses, plus or minus is, is a pretty good number. But let's assume you paid that property off. It's free and clear of debt. There's no debt. So the question would be, it's like simple math, like how many properties making $1,000 per month would I need to pay for my living expenses? And so let's, let's use the number 10,000 bucks per month. That's actually my number for our family to live in Spain, to not have to worry about money, really. We spend money. We, you know, today, we paid 150 bucks to get a, a van to pick us up at the airport in a nearby city. And we could have taken the bus. We could have done other stuff. We're like, you know what? Let's just spend the money. <laughs> we, we, got the, we got the money. That's included in a $10,000 budget for us. And you work it backwards and say, if I had 10 properties that made $1,000 per month each, that's $10,000 per month or $120,000 per year. And so when you're making your goals, you might say, you know what, I need to get approximately 10 properties that look like this in my town. And when I get to 10 properties, you could decide to stop at that point, or let's get in the weeds a little bit. You could say, you know, I'm going to buy uh, 15 properties. And one of the first ways that we started paying off debt was we bought more than we needed. So we bought 15 instead of 10, so to speak. We had, a, we had our numbers are a little bit bigger because I had a business partner, but we bought 15, we sold five of them. We kind of culled the herd, so to speak. You know, we sold off some of our of our uh, cows or sheep or whatever, and <laughs> we, we used the winnings. We used the profit from those. We didn't do 1031 exchanges to defer the taxes forever. We actually paid taxes on that, and you could do that strategically though by you know thinking about how much money you make every year and you know selling when you're in a low tax bracket, things like that. Stuff you know about as a, as a <laughs> CPA. But we would sell those properties, use the profits to pay off debt on some of the ones that we kept. So that's one really good strategy that we use is buying a little bit too much. If you wanted to own two properties, you could buy three or four, sell two, keep one or two. That's like the, I'd say like plan A as one way to do it. But you can also use like personal finance strategies like the debt snowball. Yeah, that's something else we've done. So we, my business partner and I made a game out of let's save up cash. And we actually put a separate savings account, like not in our regular account, a separate bank, a separate savings account. And that money would pile up, pile up, pile up. And when we had enough, we had a list of debts that we wanted to pay off. And sometimes these were higher interest debts, first and foremost, or these were debts that had balloon notes where you know three years from now, we had to pay the full amount of the note, which is really dangerous, by the way, in real estate, because yeah, what seriously. happens if you have to refinance $550,000 loans and no banks are loaning you money? Right. Or that's, the interest rates trouble. have gone up 4 or 5% <laughs> in the intervening time. Exactly. So we're seeing this pattern happen again. Like in 2007 and 8, it was because no banks were loaning money. In 2022, 23, it was because the interest rates really changed. And that, if you want to understand how commercial real estate got in trouble, that's pretty much it. But we small and mighty investors, we can strategically start cleaning up our debt, paying it off using debt snowballs, pay it off using selling properties. And then you can also just strategically refinance your properties. It's almost like you're restructuring your debt. For example, we had, let's just take two properties. You had two properties. Originally, there was a 70% debt, but over the last 10 years, you've paid it down to like 40% 
LTV? Well, in my opinion, I would rather have one property with debt and one property free and clear instead of having two properties that are 40%. And so what I would do is I would actually refinance that, that property and have like an 80% debt on one property and a 0% debt on the other. There's a couple of reasons for that. This is, I think of it like a strategic refinance is that you know, net, net, net is not diff- your overall portfolio is still the same loan to value because you have the same amount of debt, but you've now increased the cash flow on that free and clear property. You've reduced the risk on that free and clear property. And I would also argue, having been through the Great Recession, that when you actually owe 80% to a bank instead of 40%, you're in a better position negotiating-wise with the bank as well. Because if you have a 40% loan-to-value loan, they're going to be much more likely in an Armageddon situation where everybody's, you know, can't pay their bills or tenants aren't renting properties and the banks want to get their money back. I had friends in 2008 and 9 who had this happen where the banks, they had commercial notes and the banks said, pay us the money. No negotiating. We don't care. And it was because they had a very favorable position for the bank instead of a favorable position for the borrower. So that's just a little very specific tidbit. But all of those are ways, debt snowballs, buying more than you need, and then strategic refinances that you can clean up your portfolio and eventually end up with something that's high income, low risk, low hassle that you can sleep well at night. Yeah, I love that. I'm glad you focused also on the the snowball because I was thinking about that in terms of, okay, what would this actually look like if, let's say, you had some reserves, because I think this is important, right? Like your real estate business clearly needs to have some cash reserves on hand. So you're not advocating or by any means, okay, we're going to put all of the money we have on hand into paying down debt. That clearly not what we're talking about, but you have that amount of money set aside. And then is there an argument for, all right, let's say this person doesn't need any current income. Let's say they're working full-time, the regular W-2 job. And this is kind of like the, all right, I'm going to pull the cord or flip the switch or whatever you want to say on my W-2 when I get to X amount of debt paid off. And then, okay, every month, let's say they've got these 10 properties and they're cash flowing, I don't know, after the debt, they're cash flowing $500 a piece. So that 5,000 bucks, somebody theoretically could pay that 5,000 and just send that as an extra principal payment on let's say in your case, like you said, the highest interest loan, or maybe you do it the opposite way and it's the lowest, the lowest principle. Obviously, each person can figure that out. But I mean, that's a pretty viable strategy, right? Absolutely. Yes. And th- these are the kind of mental strategy games that you have to play. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's a lot like the index investing stock world and that this is a psychology game. It's, it, yes, it's math, like math matters, but the psychology is how can I get from point A to point B, where I can pull the plug on my W-2 and I can know that I'm getting closer. That psychology of like feeling that progress is really important. I, as someone who played sports and played and saw how people, like how human beings can do their best, like I, I realized how important motivation is. And so debt payoffs, like, like you're talking about, is a great example. If you have 5,000 bucks a month in cash flow and you have a W-2 job, so you don't need the money, just set that money aside. And the most optimized way to do it would be every single month, pick one mortgage and just pay off that one mortgage. So don't don't spread it out over, you know, 10 properties. Like that's the worst thing you can do if you want to get out of debt quickly. What you really want to do is pay off the first property and now you freed up a $1000 mortgage payment on that one. So now instead of 5000 a month, you have 6000 a month and then you go to the second property and now it is it's a snowball that keeps growing and growing and growing and not only that, it's pretty flexible too. So you might get to three or four properties and say, "You know what? I'm actually pretty good here. Like I've got, you know, 10,000 bucks a month or 8000 bucks a month coming in." You might do what we've done, my wife and I, take a mini retirement. Say, you know what? I'm going to press pause on my debt snowball and I'm just going to live off the cash flow for the next 12 months or six months. And I'm not going to wait till I'm 55 or 60 or 70 to go take this vacation. I'm going to like do it right now. And that's actually what we did. Like we, when we took our first four month trip, we were not financially independent. We had a, a couple, a thousand or two coming in in cash flow. We just saved up the extra money and then we just did it. And then we did it again. It's, every time we've taken a mini retirement, we've been a little bit better off and a little bit better off. Whereas this time in Spain, we haven't, you know, the budgeting wasn't really a big deal. It's like, all right, we got enough money in the bank. Good. Spend the money. And it's, it's just, it's been fun to see that progression of the portfolio, but also the way you can live your financial independence lifestyle based on the progress you make over time. Yeah. And I love the, your definition of a small and mighty investor from the book is, quote, own the minimum number of investments that accomplish your financial goals. I think we've talked about that and, and it's just, it's so beautiful. And, and I'm, I'm curious, so, okay, 10 to 15% of your total real estate assets, you still have, have some debt on. Is the plan to pay it off entirely? And, and if not, 
talk me through the strategy because obviously you have vastly, vastly more knowledge about real estate because it could go either way. And I'm not sure how you're going to answer this. Yeah, I mean, this is a debate that goes back and forth with my business partner. And I love I love our debates because he's super smart and we we get to kind of have our own little personal mastermind. And at the moment, I think I'm more like inclined to pay them all off just simplicity wise. But the other thing is like a lot of the loans we do have are private loans to individuals like family members and people who like actually like getting 6% interest from us or 4.5% interest. interest. And so they're like, don't pay us off. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, we, we like this interest. And so we're, we're sort of at this place where the debt we do owe is super low risk. It's friendly lenders. We have one bank loan and that one bank loan is in a really low, it's like 25% loan to value. So we're not that worried about it. So at the moment, we're not really in a, let's pay it off more. But you come back and we talk about this five, 10 years from now, I'm pretty sure our, our, we'll be debt free on most of our properties. And the other thing we're doing now, so where does the capital go? Because we have some extra capital to reinvest. We're investing with other people. Like we did one deal with another person who listened to my podcast and I got to know and he is in the fire community and we partnered with him. So we're, we're the passive partner and he and his wife bought a a property, uh, an eight unit property, and they're the operators, they're managing it. And so we're the behind the scenes money. So that's another way where we don't want to be the ones operating it. We've been there, done that. That's cool. We've got our number on management, but investing in other people uh, has been something that we've sort of, we're experimenting with. So that's at the moment, that's kind of where, where our heads are. Yeah, that's fascinating because uh, ultimately this is very personal. I think that's what's so critical about all of this is Every aspect of this is personal. You're not trying to prescribe no. what somebody should do in every particular instance. I could have seen you answering and it wouldn't have shocked me if you had said, all right, look, we have our number and we even have like our fat fine number of how much money we need per month. I think you said about 10,000, I assume, let's just say for argument's sake, your business partner the same. Then any amount over that 20,000 per month, then, hey, maybe we think about adding one more property. And then, all right, we have this management down. We know all the systems. We know what to look for. This would be simple. And then we just kind of roll that in and we pay that one off. Like that wouldn't have shocked me because I suspect it wouldn't have increased your time per week from two to four hours, you know? Yeah, that actually is happening. You, you're right. Good intuition on that one. Like, <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Like, so remember I talked about your criteria for your property. Like I'm yeah. very, very, it's called a buy box. Like my buy box is super, super tight. Like if it's not in these locations, this type of property, single family, single story, brick exterior on a crawl space. I have it very specific. That property landed on my lap while I was in, in Spain a couple months ago. It was a former, is right next door to another rental we had. It was a, an owner I talked to a long time ago. He said, hey, if you ever sell, I'd love to buy it. Please let me know. And he called me. He was ready to sell. I was in Spain and we, we had the cash to buy that. So yeah, it's, it's both. But then by buying that property, we, we could decide to just increase our portfolio by one property we also might reevaluate you know, the, the list of properties we have. We might have a new one that's at the bottom of the list. We're like, all right, this one has a bunch of trees in the yard. They're falling on the house. This one has a septic tank. That one's got to go. Like, I have a couple properties on my hit list that, like, you know, they're not bad, but they're just like, they're kind of bugging me. I don't like to think about it. And so now <laughs> that one's a good, the one we just bought is a really good property. We'll probably add one or two more to the hit list and sell those at some point. Chad, I love that concept of buy box. It reminds me of like the, the Ted Williams strike zone where yes. like, Hey, I'm going to keep this really small. If that pitch comes in, I'm going to hit 400 or more when I swing at these pitches. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, you're looking, in essence, you really are, not to torture this, but you're looking for that fat pitch. And because you're in no rush, you can sit back and, and wait. And if that comes around every three years, you buy one. If it comes around never, yeah, who cares? It's the irony of when you start having more money, you're more picky, and then the good deals start landing on your lap. That's just the, <laughs> that's the. And Warren Buffett actually has a quote. He talks about he he's the. I think he used Ted Williams as his example. He said, "Buying investments is like being in a home run derby." And for those who aren't baseball fans, like home run derby, like you do not have to swing. Like they will just keep throwing you pitches until you hit exactly where you want to hit it. And that's what he says. Like my my bat is on my shoulder until I get the fattest perfect pitch that's in my buy box. And in real estate, the more you can do that, like the more you can avoid getting desperate or trying to like I have to do this deal. Like I, I get it though. When I was a new investor, sometimes you just got to do a deal just to learn. And that's your call it a university, you know, call it your property university. But at some point, every deal you do you should get a little better and a little better. And so not only are you compounding money, but you're also compounding knowledge and skills. And so by your fifth deal, your sixth deal, your seventh deal, you should be a little bit more picky than you were on your first deal. Hmm. And yeah, in life, you can see the people who can actually follow through on that, right? And, and you also see that literally in the home run derby, which is funny. <laughs> We're talking so much about baseball here, but like 
you'll see some players, they'll let a couple of balls go past them. And then it seems like they get antsy, right? They get a little bit antsy and that next pitch comes and it's not that optimal pitch, but they swing at it anyway. I'd, I'd love to do like a, a statistical analysis on that because I suspect some people are more psychologically suited to that than others. And yeah, you're seeing that certainly with Mr. Buffett and Munger. I mean, they sit around, they sit on their hands all the time. That's what makes them great, that they don't jump at stupid things. They wait for that fat pitch. And, and so going back to the small and mighty investor, kind of bringing this full circle, I feel like being small gives you that same attitude that Buffett and Munger have. Because when you go big, when you start having overhead and you have, you know, you have to pay for an office, you got to pay for people salaries. There's a time and place for that. But when you're small and simple with low overhead or no overhead, now you are the patient investor. Now you don't have to do the stupid move. And so it's all, it's all works together. Like the more you can keep things small and simple, I just, my own experience has been not only are you going to be, have more peace of mind, you're going to be able to sleep at night, but you're also going to buy better deals. Like you're just going to be a better investor. And I, I, I just, I've been a big believer in this before I even knew the name of it. But part of me writing this book was like, I, I want to operationalize this and I want to have the techniques. For example, when should you pay off debt? When should you not? When should you sell properties? How should you sell properties? How do you finance properties in a way that doesn't sacrifice the whole thing? Like I have a, set, a list of seven safe debt rules that I've used over the years. And most of those have been mistakes I've made and I, I got burned and had to learn from it. So like that's the kind of stuff when you try to emulate a style of real estate investing or any investing, you want to find someone who, first of all, works it backwards from the same place you're trying to go to. They're not trying to scale to the moon. They're trying to get to the same place you're trying to go to. And then not that you're going to emulate exactly what I, I'm going to do because that's impossible, but you can borrow principles, you can borrow best practices, you can borrow techniques. And that's what you know, the cool thing about books is that it's, it's the best I've learned in the last 21 years as an investor condensed into a book that you can hold in your palm and you can use that as a cheat code as a real estate investor. That to me, like still blows my mind that the books are this amazing tool for that. Yeah, it's remarkable. This book specifically, I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of 375 pages. And we have touched on the tiniest, tiniest little bit of this. I think the important stuff, of course, right? Like the actual ethos behind the small and mighty but let's be clear, the book dives into every little nook and cranny of the real estate world from building teams and negotiating to debt to finding properties, all of this stuff. We couldn't possibly talk about that on, a, on one podcast <laughs> as we'd be here for 20 hours. But for the fledgling real estate investors, I mean, this book, it really has a little bit of everything. So Chad, we're going to tell people where to find the book in a minute, but I always have to close the loop. I would uh, kick myself as a podcast listener and certainly as a podcast host. I said before that we would come back to basically what you can't outsource or you, we talked about the, okay, two to four hours per week after all of this stuff. Can you just give like a, a real quick sense of like what a couple of those things might be? Yeah. So believe it or not, the most time I spend still is bookkeeping. And so we, we were actually in the process of hiring a bookkeeper and we've had a bookkeeper in the past and she was great. She retired. And we just kind of took on the bookkeeping ourselves. So between me and my business partner, my business partner usually reconciles our bank accounts. I usually go back and like enter all the information on the transactions. At this point, we don't have as many transactions, you know, like most of them are pretty, pretty simple. But yeah, bookkeeping is like 50% or more of that. And the way it works, practically speaking, like I said, average of two hours per week. But, you know, one week might be, you know, I do four or five hours of bookkeeping for the month. And then that's all one day. Like I set aside a Thursday to do that and I really focus and do my deep work on that. And then other weeks though, I might have like just 30 minutes. And what that, that 30 minutes is actually pretty strategic and important. I'm usually getting, I'm responding to text or emails from my property managers. There's a, a relationship we have with them. They're my most important team member at where I am in my stage. So we have two different property managers in Clemson, both do a great job. They might text me, for example, and say, hey, we need to replace the refrigerator. It's going to be a $800 or $1,000 expense. That's over the $500 that you've given us allowance to spend. So I give them, I give them some leeway. Like, hey, if it's- okay. Tim two, Ferriss style. Exactly. That's where I, where I got it from. Yeah. But if it was 250 300 bucks, just do it. I still want to know about it, but I'm going, to, I'm going to learn about it in the report at the end of the month. I'm not going to learn about it you know, and have to make a decision because I'm somewhere else and it's hard to get in touch with me. I don't want to be the, the delay in them solving the problem for our tenant on an emergency or something. But if it's a refrigerator, they send me a text. And so I, you know, that's the other you know, 30, really literally 30 minutes a week. Hey, I got a text. This, I, I spent some time responding, go for it. Usually it's just like, yep, go for it. That's fine. Or I say, Hey, that seems a little high. Can you shop around and get another quote for that? That kind of stuff. And so, you know, responding to property managers and bookkeeping 
And then one of the other reasons we're only spending two hours is we're, we're in a maintenance mode now. We're not buying, selling, remodeling. That's where most of the time as a real estate investor spent is in that load up phase, is in the acquisitions, is in the managing contractors like that. When we were doing that, we spent a lot more time on it. But I always tell people real estate investing is really interesting because it begins like a startup company where you have to spend a lot of time on it and it ends like a blue chip stock. Like it ends like a, you know, yeah. literally a couple hours per week. And for me, yes, it's not as passive as a index fund. Maybe you spend zero hours that week, but it's passive enough. Like I've done, every, I've never had my real estate business get in the way of me doing what I want to do in my life. Two hours per week from anywhere in the world. Like, <laughs> okay, that works yeah, for me. That and me. That's good. That's about as passive as it gets. I think the uh, the myth of passive income is uh, is something that you and I both know, especially uh, people think so many forms of income are passive and very few are. I mean, obviously, Chooseify is a labor of love for me, but my family will tell you for darn sure that I'm up here on my computer a lot of times and there's nothing passive about this. Obviously, I don't think of it as an, as an income generating thing, but nevertheless, like there's very few types of business that are truly passive. But man, to cut something down to two to four hours per week, and it sounds like, I mean, Chad, my challenge to you would be, man, get a bookkeeper that you like and trust. I mean, you guys shouldn't be doing that at this point. That's that's silly. You're right. You're right. But uh, bookkeeping is, is kind of, this is a peculiarity for me. Like it's, it's a little therapeutic ah. and it's also a little bit of, it's a little bit of me. It's like cleaning the kitchen. Like it's not something you really want to do, but like once you do it, it's like, all right, now I know where my business is. I know what things are going on because I'm not involved in the day to day. Like I think about bookkeeping. I tell people it's kind of like a, a superpower like Neo <laughs> in the matrix where like Neo, he saw everything with zeros and ones when they finally got a superpower. Like I see bookkeeping that way. And I've heard of a lot of business owners who still look at the books on a regular, who still write checks, who still do stuff like that, or still pay the bills because it's like the lifeblood of the business. And if you can just get a little glimpse into it, you can actually understand what's going on. And every once in a while, you identify a problem that needs, it's an acute problem that really needs more attention. And so then you can jump right into it. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things, but what I, we are hiring a bookkeeper and what I'm going to have him or her do is they're going to do the reconciliations of the bank accounts. They're going to do just the basic entries and then I'm going to go back and I'm just, my bookkeeping time that I'll still have is looking at the KPIs, the key performance indicators, like, all right, what's our vacancy on our properties? What are the, where, where are we reinvesting money? Like, I, I think I could spend that time optimizing the business instead of just cleaning up the kitchen. Right. Debits and credits. Yeah. Look at the, yeah. I love that. That's really great. And, and also frankly, know thyself. That's a really critical thing. Obviously I, I tongue in cheek with my little challenge to you, but, but it sounds like that's time well spent, at least much of it is. And like you said, maybe you can yeah. focus a little more on KPI and a little less, but are we really going to quibble over? It's probably we're talking a half hour here at the end of the day. Exactly. Chad, this has been an amazing conversation. Absolutely. You know, I love, love chatting with you on or offline. This has been even better than I anticipated. So the book, we're publishing this on July 17th. The book comes out in three days this Thursday. Tell people where to find it and what they do to purchase. Yeah, so I know we'll have links in the in the show notes and the description, but it's if you go to biggerpockets.com forward slash small and mighty, just written out like that. That is the the page where you can order the book. And if you happen to be listening to this on July 17th, the day this podcast episode comes out, it's still gonna be in the pre-order phase, but that could be a good thing too if you pre-order it. I have some really cool bonuses that come with buying it before July 20th. For example, I'm gonna have a, a live Q&A call where I'm gonna talk about how to apply this to the 2023 market and what the difference is you know, with high interest rates and limited supply, how does this apply? So that's something else that you can get. And I'm also gonna give away some one-on-one coaching and signed copies of the books, stuff like that. So that is the, the pre-order. And if you listen to this after July 20th, it'll be available in that same link and you can get it through bigger pockets. And I just hope it's something that is, is helpful for you. It's a guide. I put my heart and soul into it to, to be as helpful as, as possible for you and to be a guide for investors who aren't trying to scale to the moon, who want to work it backwards from lifestyle, free time, whether you're a beginner, whether you're further along. I have a lot of investors who are 10 years into this, but they want to figure out, how do I get out of this thing? How do I like live off this income? That's a big part of my why of writing the book is serving them as well. Yeah. I love it. And like I said, the book is fantastic. It's like a, a, this overview of this mindset, but B it's the nuts and bolts of all these aspects, all this that you've picked up, this knowledge, this hard won knowledge over 15 plus years as a real estate investor, it's in the book. So the book is fantastic. Like you said, we will have it in the show notes, but it's biggerpockets.com slash small and mighty. So write out and A and D. 
And BiggerPockets was nice enough to actually give a 10% discount for anyone listening to this. So put in the promo code CHOOSEFI. So caps uh, shouldn't matter, but yeah, it's just CHOOSEFI. That'll get you 10% off. And that's whether it's the pre-sale. And like you said, the pre-sale, you have all these amazing little bonuses. So if you want to pick that up in the next two days, that would be fantastic or after the fact. And Chad, we were talking and you were incredibly kind to also offer a PDF of your personal buy box. And we talked about that in the episode. It is, I, I'm super excited to see this when, when you send it over. And if you want to get a copy of that PDF, actually get on the ChooseFI email newsletter. So choosefi.com slash subscribe, or just go to literally any page on our website in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a box for the Fi Weekly. Get on that, and I'm gonna send that out the following week. So that'll be July 25th. I, I personally handwrite this email every week send it out Tuesday morning. So that'll come out July 25th. And Chad, I really appreciate all you do for our community and for being here. This was great. Brad, it's always fun. I, I personally enjoy it. Like you said, we, we have fun just kicking it around and exchanging ideas. But uh, this has been an honor. Choose FI is a big part of my own journey and just really appreciate what you guys have done building the community and everybody listening too. This is a this is the best best community on the internet. Great folks. And I just I hope this will be this episode has been helpful for you and kind of helps you move forward in your own five journey. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words. And this truly is an amazing community. And thank you all for listening and being a part of it and taking action, most importantly. So until next time, Chad, thanks again. Thank you.